join me in welcoming Dominic to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here at Augmented World Expo. I appreciate the fact that even though we're talking about augmented reality first and foremost, I will be talking about virtual reality. And what I'll be talking about are the challenges that virtual reality offers to the market that is out there, and especially in terms of rendering performance. What I can, what I can say and what I wanna, wanna hear from, from, the, from the audience is, um, first of all, who of you is actively working on VR right now? And who of you have never tried VR at all? Okay, that's a good audience then. Um, I'm just asking this because I want to know how deep, uh, how deep I should go into the topic of the rendering challenges for virtual reality. But before I do that, I want to introduce me and what I'm doing at NVIDIA. So I'm a huge virtual reality enthusiast. Four years ago, I've tried the original duct-taped prototype of the Oculus Rift, back when it, when, when it was still literally a ripped out um, smartphone display with a couple of sensors held together literally by duct tape. And even then, the, the, the impression that I got from, the, from this experience was really mind-blowing to me. I did everything I could to, to push the medium as far as I can. I, I started the, the largest inofficial community for, uh, for virtual reality on the net, which is the Oculus subreddit. I co-founded a an, an non-profit organization called EUVR, which is there to push the envelope for European VR developers so that the United States, and especially Silicon Valley, doesn't have as crazy a head start as they already have. Because I know how crazy the head start is, I've also had my own VR company called Realities.io um, in Silicon Valley. They're still going strong. Uh, one of my co-founders co will actually be speaking later today. Um, but right now, what, what my job is at NVIDIA is to push the envelope for, European VR, uh, for the European VR ecosystem. So essentially, what I've been doing on the side before is now my main job, and I'm getting paid for that, which is kind of cool. And me, as a, as a huge VR enthusiast, I believe that um, personal entertainment in VR will be huge. So there will be a lot of industries that will be changed by virtual reality. But not only entertainment is the, is the important part, because that's an obvious choice. Also, what's super interesting is the professional side of things. So all of you know that um, AR is, is going to be big. It's going to be changing a lot of things. Um, and one of those will be, for example, the design. So the Audi VR experience is something that I always, always bring up. It's, some, it's something where you have a, a car configurator. You can choose your own car. You can choose what kind of seats you want, what kind of steering wheel you want. And then, and, and then later on, that car gets delivered to you as, you as you configured it before. And there's a ton of other applications, medical VR, architectural visualiza visualization. All these things will be changed by virtual reality. But, there's a large but, there are a lot of computing challenges in simulating reality. If you want to get people a very, very convincing experience, then you have to do not only the graphics side of things, but you also have to care about audio, about touch, so the interaction with the virtual world, and also a physical simulation. If you're going into a virtual reality, you want things to behave just as they would in real life. So you want water to flow like water does in real life. You want fire to react like fire in real life. You want everything to be very convincing. And that is essential for a good VR experience. And I'm going to touch on all of these topics today. So first of all, graphics. VR, VR has a lot of performance demands. So if you, if you take into account a normal game that's running on, at 30 FPS on a full HD monitor, that's about 60 megapixels per second. For VR, that is about eight times the bandwidth that you need to get to a very, very good experience. So you have two displays, one for the left eye, one for the right eye. You, you have to drive them at a way higher resolution and also at a higher frame rate of 90 frames per second. That comes up to about 450 megapixels per second that you have to push through the pipeline. And not only the performance is very demanding for VR, but you also have to, have to go for super low latency. I mean, many of you all already know that it's essential for AR, it's essential for VR as well. And from the, way, from the moment that you move your head till, uh, until the photons hit, hit the retina, that's called motion to photon la latency. And many studies show that it should be, be uh, below 20 milliseconds. If you go back again, thinking about 90 frames per second, 
that means the rendering alone takes 11 milliseconds. So you have to squeeze, into, uh, squeeze a lot into that, into that motion to photon latency. So how do, we, how do we do that at NVIDIA and with other companies that are working hard on making the VR pipeline faster? First of all, I want to recap a little bit about how uh, GPU rendering works. So for, first of all, a GPU draws 3D geometry. Then it projects that 3D geometry onto a 2D, onto a 2D um, surface, which essentially is your monitor. And then the, 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 the individual pixels get filled with the coloring of, the, of this particular scene. And in VR, you can do a couple of things that you, that, that you couldn't do on a, on a monitor. So for example, um, when you're using a virtual reality headset, you're always looking through lenses. And the lenses are stretching out the image towards the, towards the periphery more than in the center. So for example, if you take a look at, if you take a look at this, um, this slide, there's a, there's a uh, red rectangle on the left side. You see on the right side, it gets squeezed a lot. So a lot of image information is essentially getting lost. And you can take advantage of that by rendering those parts of the image that get that gets squeezed more um, at lower resolution. So at NVIDIA, we've introduced something with the Maxwell generation called um, multi-res shading. And that essentially means that you divide the viewport into nine, in, into nine smaller viewports and then only render the center one at full resolution. The outer parts are rendered at lower resolution. And on the right, on the, on the right picture, you see all the black space around is, are essentially pixels that you're saving. So you're not rendering these pixels because they get stretched out anyway um, during, the, during, the, um, during the reflection in the lenses. But this means that there are, there's a, a line in, at which you can see the different resolutions. So essentially, the outer viewports are, render, are more blurry than the center one because there's a hard line in between. What we've done with, um, with the new Pascal architecture, which is the 10, the 10 series of uh, GeForce graphics cards, is called lens match shading. And lens match shading allows you to have a linear, uh, linear variable um, pixel density along, along the middle line and the, and, and the center line. So that means that um, you're essentially rendering to a surface that is very close to the lens that you're looking through which means that you don't see any, any hard lines, you don't see any, um, any switches from the, from the main center view to the periphery. And again, on the, on the right picture, you see that um, you're essentially saving a lot of pixels, so you're um, not putting as much pressure on the pixel shader. So the pixel shader si side of things is covered. But what about geometry? Um, tr in traditional stereo rendering for VR, you do a geometry pass for the left eye and a geometry pass for the right eye because you have a little bit of distance in between those, those, those images. And usually that takes two geometry passes on the GPU. What you can also do and what we've, in, what we've implemented in our, in our GPUs is called single pass stereo. So essentially you do a single geometry pass and then extract this, uh, the information to the, uh, for the left eye and for the right eye. And that essentially means that you're saving one whole geometry pass, which means you can have twice as much geometry in a scene at the same performance. Or you can use the same amount of geometry and instantly get about 30% of performance boost, which is pretty huge for VR developers. As you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges when it, comes to, when it comes to the bandwidth that is needed for VR. So those are the things that are performance, that are interesting from a performance standpoint. But also what I, what I touched upon is the motion to photon latency, which is also key to a very comfortable experience. There's a trick that many of you might be, uh, might be aware of. I still wanna, get, uh, still wanna go through it really quickly, which is called um, asynchronous time warp. What asynchronous time warp does is, usually when you, when you move your head, the image, um, the, this information gets sent to the, to the CPU the CPU uh, forwards that in, uh, processes it and forwards that information to the, to the GPU, and the GPU then sends, an, sends the information to the display, which gets scanned out, which gets, gets scanned out line by line, and then the, the backlight flash comes that puts the photons into your retina. What you can, there's, but there's a little bit of a problem here. If you move your head really fast, 
the time it takes for the rendering and also for the scan out might lead to your head being a diff in, a different in a different position than it was 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds ago. So um, John Carmack and Michael Abresh came up with a very good idea at Oculus, which is called asynchronous time warp. And that means that before you send the, before you send the information to the display, you take a last second look at the head position. And then a, a software algorithm shifts the pixels by a small amount that is, that is related to the way your head position changed within that time. So essentially, you take a last second look and then shift it a, a tiny little bit, and that lowers the perceived latency by a lot. With, so this was implemented, this was implemented already. Um, what we've done in, with our Pascal architecture is a system called preemption. So essentially, that means that usually you have a pretty long, um, a pretty conservative preemption request. So you have to take the, the time into account that you actually need to interrupt the GPU. What you don't have to do with Pascal is um, the fact that you can essentially interrupt the G GPU at a very fine granularity. You don't have to wait for the last draw call to finish. You can already, you can already, um, you can already save a little, bit of, a little bit of time on top of the asynchronous time warp because you can look closer to the actual, to the actual scan out of the display. So I've covered three things. Um, first of all, there's the, there's the uh, pixel shader that isn't, that isn't um, uh, pr there's, there's not as, as much pressure on the pixel shader. You can have greater geometry detail because of the, because of the single pass stereo. And then also you have a fa faster time warp with preemption. But graphics isn't everything in VR. Audio is also super important. If you're playing a VR game and a bullet flies by your head, you want to hear it coming from the backside. You want to turn your head instantly just because of the way your, your human perception works in that regard. Most of you probably know this, but the, your, your ears are very much an, an, uh, as a tracking system by itself. So what, what you can do is uh, your ears can tell the time difference from the, from the sound reaching your individual ears. So if something's coming, coming from the right side, for example, it first hits my right, my right ear, then it hits my left ear, and the time difference is used to, um, to locate the sound source. Also, the level of the noise is, is important. So for example, if something again comes from the right, it will be louder on my, on, my, on my right ear than it will be on my left ear. But then also there's interesting things like spectral cues. So for example, your body knows how the sound waves are being reflected off your shoulders, off the back of your head, and even the back of your ears. And all these things are used when you're, when you're doing um, HRTF, which is a head-related transfer function, which essentially means that you're taking all of these spectral cues, sound sources, and locations into account and use those for uh, simulating them in VR. And it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, tricky, it's a pretty tricky thing to do um, from a computational perspective. So what we've done is we've used a, our optics ray tracing engine. So essentially something that we've built for graphic um, simulation to use in, uh, for audio. So what this does is it takes into account the, the geometry of the, of the scene, it takes into account spectral cues, it takes into account um, things like how sound propagates through a, volu through a volume. So this is, all, this is all built into our VRWorks SDK. But we also want to cover other things like interaction, for example. Most of you probably know this, but NVIDIA has been building a physics um, SDK for a long time. So we've been simulating physics on a very, very um, fundamental level. And now we're using that to build a layer upon those information. So for example, if you're hitting two swords um, against each other, the system can tell that geometry is being, uh, that two pieces of geometry are touching each other and you can then forward that information to the, to the haptics layer. And we're using physics also um, in a way that the, the, the experience is very lifelike. So as I touched on, um, you need destructible objects to behave like, like destructible objects. You want fluid to, to behave like water does in real life. You want things like your hairs or the hairs of, a, of an animal to move exactly the same way they would in real life, which is very, very important. So we've built something which includes all of this, all of the, all of these tech. Um, it includes physics. It, it includes VR works. It includes all the performance boost. It's called NVIDIA VR Funhouse, and it is a, it is free for everyone to to enjoy. That has an HTC Vive. The Oculus version is coming out soon. 
There is going to be a video here that I skip because I only have about 20 seconds of time. But it's essentially a mini game, a mini game uh, tech demo where our developers try to build a sandbox where they could play around with different um, physics interactions in VR. And we realized that it's actually so much fun that we, re that we released it as a game, which is the first game that NVIDIA has ever released, which makes me kind of proud because it's a VR game. And um, um, what I've just talked about is all included in our VRWorks SDK. And developers love it. So there's, there's people from Solfar Studios who've, who've, played, um, who've made Everest VR, um, the people from Stress Level Zero who are the, the masterminds behind Hover Junkers, and also people like CCP that have been building games for ages. They are also using, they are also using uh, VRWorks and get about a 30% performance boost out of the box. So there, as I said, there's a growing VRWorks adoption. I don't want to go into too much detail on this, on this slide. Only the top, the top two right ones are very important because the two major engines that are being used for virtual reality both support uh, VRWorks. Unreal Engine is already out. The Unity implementation is coming soon. And essentially, every developer that is using those engines can take advantage and, and profit from the, from the stuff that, pe that people that are R&D lab and our tech guys at NVIDIA have built since for years and years to make virtual reality a better experience. If there's one, if there's one slide you want to take a photo of, it's probably this one, because I we want to get as many developers on VRWorks as possible. It is really a very good thing. I I'm saying this not as a NVIDIA spokesperson, but as a VR enthusiast. These kind of things really make VR experiences so much better. So please, if you're, if you're an active developer or you know someone that wants to have a better VR experience or build a better VR experience, please send them my way. Thank you, everyone, for, for, the, for the attention, and have a great AWE.